Welcome to the HMO Property Podcast, where we connect, educate, and inspire the UK's HMO property community. So stop what you're doing, sit back, relax, and enjoy the story. What's up, HMO Nation, and welcome to another episode of the HMO Property Podcast with me, Rupert Wallace, in association with hmohub.co.uk. In this episode, we're interviewing successful HMO property investor, Matthew Layton. Matthew's going to take us on his HMO property investment journey so far, including the ups, the downs, the highs, and the lows. Now, Matthew's been investing in HMOs for some two years now. He's completed two HMO projects, currently housing 12 tenants. So let's jump straight in. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Great for you to be here. Matt, before we dive into the details of your HMO journey, tell us a little bit about yourself um, before you started your uh, your property journey. Yeah, sure. So um, I come from a corporate background. Uh, my family come from a family of employees, I'd say, so working for someone else. Um, I've been, I started working corporately in 2010, uh, did all right for the first few years. Then my mother had a kind of accident that kind of jolted me out of my kind of status quo weakness. Uh, I was back in 2016, at not 20. 13 I think or something and then ever since then I started reading about kind of self-development stuff about audiobooks um blogs read personal development to try and imp- impact my or influence my corporate career to kind of become more successful I read I applied I did and in the end I managed to double my salary was ta- starting talking to the CEO of the company that I still currently work for and then um I achieved a salary level that was a kind of where I came from, it was higher than what I thought that I'd ever achieve. Um, and then when I achieved it, it kind of makes you think, what next? I knew that the path that I was currently on was going to basically say, okay, if I wanted more money, I'd basically need to sacrifice more of my time. And in, what was really important to me was to spend more time with the family and have the ability to travel more. So it was kind of a contradictory in terms of, oh, well, I want to make, not make more money, but I want to make the money to achieve the lifestyle I want but I don't want to sacrifice my time so that kind of brought me up to kind of close to two years ago where I started looking for other ways of investing really just trying to make money more passively. Tell us about your corporate career Matt what did you do? So I I still do it basically I'm a techie in some simplistic terms I started off coding um, and then when I when I got through spent about five years coding and then i slowly moved into more kind of it consultancy type work and then i become more of a data consultant specializing in kind of manipulating data big warehouses to try and store and give generate reports and then now i'm still working for the same company um but i'm in more of a uh consultant slash property project manager sort of role um which is good because um i'll talk about this in a book re- recommendation but if you guys have viewed of tim ferris four hour work week it's a fantastic book that i'd recommend to anyone but it's it's all about trying to get more done in less time and not just that it's all about trying to value your time and do other things that you want to do with your time outside so i've managed to do that in my corporate job which is why i'm still working for it because i've managed to do I still get paid the same decent salary for doing not as much time effort, but I'm still generating the same amount of output as what I was in the 40 hours a week or so. So it's a no brainer for me to kind of keep going until things change. And are you a self-taught um, coder? And um, I, throughout all my thing, I've kind of stumbled upon what I've found interesting. So I've always liked computers, just like every boy does in video games. I started, went to, I did university local to me, about 30 minutes in Cardiff University. I studied computer science, which is quite a 
generic thing. I like the coding part and then um, they taught you bits and pieces there and then I just kept it going. I liked coding, so I found a job that did coding and then, um, yeah, here I am now. It helps me a lot, the coding part in the property bits as well, which is, you know, it's not yeah. lost. Uh, tell us how. So what I've done is um, some, something similar simple and trivial such as just understanding excel formulas for example just to um i've got a virtual assistant that does my kind of deal analysis scraping properties and stuff for me and i got a system that say she does that she inputs it into the spreadsheet and then i got some figures that say whether it's important for me to look at or not i've also got her doing stuff like um web scraping so pulling stuff off right move spare room and all them places just to get um I use it for two things. One is to kind of understand the supply and demand in my local area. Uh, the other one is to see about the price points, to see like what other landlords are charging their tenants, just to make sure that I'm kind of keeping up with the game. Pull all our data and stick it into some friendly format for me. So uh, there's there's loads of ways that um, if you've done the kind of Simon Zucci thing we were talking about previously, um, his course, uh, I came out to be a mechanic personality, which is um, a... I like to know that there's something already in this world, like property, that's already been done before, but it's so, in some ways, old and clunky and mechanical that there's ways of systemizing it and leveraging it, and that's why I've kind of, kind of tried doing in a lot of the stuff that I've done. People who systemize their property business very well, mechanics, tend to do very well in property. Uh, <laughs> we've 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 experienced that. Um, having seen and spoken to hundreds, maybe thousands of HMO property investors now. And the successful ones are the ones that do exactly that. Yeah, I mean, at the moment, it's one of them ones where I'd say I've got over a lot of the nervousness of the first ones, because you're always, especially where you haven't got one yet, you kind of have a lot of self, uh, self doubt in yourself to be like, oh, you've got so many unknown questions in your head about, you know, will I find tenants to charge the room rents I got? Will I find a property that's cheap enough to buy that my spreadsheet's okay? Will I be able to revalue it to pull out all the cash that these courses tell you that, you know, a lot of them brag about kind of no money down or no money left in and people really try looking for that. And um, it's only when you get past the, you need the education, but then when you have the experience that is in a league of its own. It's only when you get the experience where you can really kind of understand, oh, right, this is real world. And it's from that experience I've had, which I'm now, I, I treat my, I've got two completed projects already. I've got one being refurbished at the moment and I've got two, one is bought and the other one's being bought at the moment. It's just a case of now just waiting. Every week I check for new deals. I see a new deal. I size it up quite quickly now. I think on my Facebook page, I did a 20 minute video just showing how I look at it or how I analyzed, analyze HMO deals. Um, and yes, Perfect. It's, it's Tell you what, Matt, we'll talk about that in the, in a bit further on. Sorry. But for now, let <laughs> me just ask you this question of how exactly we really want to know the crux, almost the moment where, of how you got into the world of HMO property investing. Cool. So, um, I, um, I read a lot of books and one of them I read was about portioning up your um, income. So 10% of my income goes towards my education. Um, and then I also got opened up to go to networking events. I started reading audiobooks about investing and most of them were generally based on a generic investing stocks and shares, ISAs, bonds. Um, but then I read a really good book called Money by Rob Moore. Um, where he kind of um, personalized it to be like property is a good vehicle, property isn't as risky as people think, property can be quite passive. And in my kind of criteria, I was looking for four things from um, investing. One was to kind of be as passive as possible. I know HMOs aren't passive, but they are. I, I would, basically, if I don't do anything for a month, I'm still likely to get paid for a month, which is not something you can say against, against an active income. I wanted to look for some ways of replacing my income and property is an easy way to kind of accumulate that in a short amount of time. I wanted to basically um, not quit my job because I always found it nervous to be like, well, don't I kind of rip the carpet out of the income that I've already got just to kind of start up. 
Um, and then the other one is from the active side. I didn't want to um, replace my current job with a more active job, such as, um, I don't know, using my coding skills to become a web developer or um, mobile developer, because that would still involve my time to make a app that would be seen by thousands or the time to keep and maintain client base or something. So I started looking for property uh, networking events, found the pin event. From that, I instantly signed up to the one day course um, just because it was only 100 quid and it was within my 10% budget. And from that, I kind of went into the three day course because for two reasons. It was a bit pricey, but the seller for me was that I could take my wife. So um, for all the it's kind of a little tip, like a brief tip, which is don't try to do property all by yourself. It will be 10 times harder if you don't try to involve your family. If you go it alone and you'll have hard times, I've had hard times, you need that support in the family life to at least understand some of the stuff you're going through to support you through it. Or it just doesn't seem, you don't need an extra negative in your life. Got it. And was there anything holding you back getting into HMO property investing? Yes. Um, at first, it sounded like such a big, scary thing. Like It just seemed to be... When I first started looking at property, I was going to, we both agreed with the wife that we were going to do the cliche, um, start small, go big, because HMO sound like a big thing. Um, in hindsight, I don't think they are, but there's more checks you need to do. So with the, um, we were going to do flips just to say, oh, we're just going to look for a property. Uh, we live in South Wales, so the Rhondda Valleys is quite the cheap place to buy houses. About 40 grand you could buy a house and you'd look to do it for 70, 80. Um, so that seemed to be less risk. Um, but then after going on one of the three day courses, I was always aiming towards HMOs and it kind of dawned on me at that point that um, it isn't that much more risk to do HMOs. It costs more money per house. Um, but at the time, the wife was seven months, um, two months pregnant with our first child. And I'd read all these books about kind of inspiring your child or being a success or a role model for your child. And uh, it was also treated like a timeline, as in to me, there was seven months left until my world kind of tipped upside down in terms of responsibility. And I wanted to kind of hit the ground running with property before that. So I used that as a tight deadline. Hence why I went straight into HMOs instead of flipping, because um, that was ultimately where I'd get my cash flow. That's where I'd get my profit. Flips would still take as long to buy a house, to do it up and to possibly sell it on as it would to buy a HMO, do a HMO up and then fill the room. So it was a timelines and budget. It wasn't that much more risk for me to just go straight into HMOs. So that's what we did. Got it. Tell us about your very first HMO property deal. Give us some numbers. Where was it? What kind of tenants? How it came about? So um, I joined the 12-month Simon Zuji course in October 2018 um i think it was october 2018 yeah no it was last year october 2017 and then on that they teach you about kind of ways of marketing direct to vendors so i sent out letters to landlords which basically said hi me and my wife are looking to buy houses in newport south wales because that was the area we picked and um if you're interested in selling or want to talk get in touch with us that's basically the gist of the letter it took three times sending that letter and kind of six months to pass before my first credible lead um, called me with a deal that matched, that kind of met the numbers of my spreadsheet and seemed to be a good enough opportunity to pull, not all your cash, because it's hard, really hard to find and pull all your cash out deal, but most of my cash to make it meet my return on investment I was looking for on profit. It's in Newport, South Wales. It was a five bed HMO. It was £125,000 that I paid for it. Um, refurb cost, I spent about 70, no, about 82 grand for that refurb and furnish furnishings. I turned it from a five bed HMO to a six bedroom HMO, just two bathrooms, no en suites. Um, and now I let it full time to um, just professionals. I won't call them young professionals. Um, I just call. For example, in there at the moment, they're between 20 and 20 and 55 or 20 and 50. So they're kind of all over the place. They're just, they're just workers, I call them. <laughs> okay. Um, so you're a couple of hundred grand in. Uh, what is it cash flow today? So it cash flows. Um, 
I think it's £2,750 gross uh, after bills and letting agents and kind of the odd 10% pot for putting maintenance aside. It nets me about £1,200 to £1,400 a month. So again, that's, that's kind of what they teach. It's like the you know the thousand pound per house type cash flow, and it, it is getting me a thousand pound. It's my job to make sure that all the rooms are full. Um, but yeah, it, it is. I, I've got to finish off the bit. That, um, uh, as an end valuation wise, um, it's now valued at two hundred and forty five thousand. Um, and I pulled out. I can't remember how much I pulled out, but all that's left in is. Thirty-five thousand um, pounds. I'm. What was it? I was already. It cost me one hundred thirty-five thousand pounds to kind of buy and refurb. So I pulled out basically a hundred grand, you could argue. And then, since I'm getting twelve hundred pound roughly per month, overall the numbers work out that I'm getting a thirty-eight percent return on investment. So that's basically if I had that thirty grand in a bank. They'd be giving me 39 percent interest, which is it's just unheard of in a in a thing. So, I was fortunate enough to be pessimistic enough in my first deal that I spent way more on refurb than what I planned to, um, and I got undercut the first time on my valuation, but I still came out good enough, which is a I say that's part pessimism, part luck as well. But the education helps to make sure that you're. Mm doing most of the things good all right it's interesting isn't it because if you were just going to do a flip project um i mean your margin on cost there you've spent a couple of hundred grand and you you're worth 245 grand if you're just going to do a flip project you'd aim for a 10 to 20 percent um margin on cost you know you'd aim to sell a 200 grand property for 240 grand but the difference is you wouldn't have the exit if you didn't do an hmo you wouldn't have an exit where you could rent it out and cover the cash flow you know times three you know cover cover the costs um and some so it is interesting because it is really it's a very similar strategy and people don't realize that when they're doing it buy something add value to it mm either rent it out and refinance it or flip it on and i guess if you sold yours today knowing knowing that you got undercut you're going to make you know the best part of 50 grand for your time plus the interim cash flow yeah and that's the interesting thing. i mean what i would say is that i love hmos because the reason why i'm doing property is because i want at first i kept saying maybe because i've taught in the courses to replace my income um i don't say like that anymore i say I'm not doing it to replace my income. I'm doing it to cover my lifestyle lifestyle expenses. Now, the difference in that is all about working out how much money you can afford, how much money, what do you want to do with your life? Kind of chunk that up into 12 months or just use your bills every month to work out how much you need to support the lifestyle that you want to achieve. So that's the number I'm aiming for. I'm aiming for the number per month, which is roughly works out to be four HMOs um to basically cover the lifestyle that i want to achieve great matt how has investing in hmos changed your life oh massive i mean what um what it's done is first of all it's given me probably the financial freedom kind of mindset i still say i'm working for the corporate job but if they sacked me tomorrow um i'd be able to sustain the lifestyle that i've currently got and that's an incredible feeling because i've now the wife is 34 weeks pregnant, so we're expecting our second child in three to eight weeks. And congratulations! Um, thank you. And the thought of that, if I, I try to, I sometimes think of God. What would my mindset be like if I only had my corporate job? And I'm pretty certain a lot of people can resonate with this. Is you, your thought pattern is probably like, oh crap, I need to. Um, I've got a good salary. I need to work hard. To maintain that salary because if i lose it uh because i was the let's say the breadwinner in the house um then our family would really suffer as a lifestyle and that put an, an enormous pressure on me mentally but not only that i'd probably end up spending less time with my family because i'd be you know doing the perceived goodness in the work environment they'd be work 50 60 hours i'd be traveling more to the where the where the key stakeholders are in the company just to kind of show my face to mainly keep my job and that's not what i wanted so it's an incredible feeling that one 
second bit is that it's um, enabled us to kind of get the trade that we trust and give a good quality finish at a cheap, uh, not cheap, but at a good value. Um, we are, we have exchanged on a house yesterday and we're going to complete in a few weeks time, but we're moving to our next kind of house. Basically it's a bigger house, enough room for kids to have each room, enough room for kids to have their separate play area closer to the seaside. Um, and all of that is from the skills that I've learned from looking for deals through HMOs, but also knowing the right broker who can talk to you about mortgage finance, knowing the right builders and electricians and plumbers who can kind of source the stuff and also knowing how to kind of kit out a house. So all of them little things has made me buy a house that was, I bought it under value. I was treating it like a, I know they say when you buy your own house, you shouldn't buy it like you would uh, an investment property, but we weren't, we were happy where we were. This was going to be if they accept this offer, ace. And yeah, we got our first below market value deal um, from our own personal family home. So yeah, it's got real potential. We're going to kit it out two months refurb and then hopefully we're going to possibly consider doing Airbnb in the basement and all that jazz. So it's exciting times. Sounds pretty life changing to me. Matt, what's your favorite part of HMO property investing? Um, Probably the, um, I like design and I like being creative. So I, I do like the part that I'm currently going through my, with my third house, which is turning it from an ugly duckling to a beautiful swan type thing. I, I like that transformation. So I like seeing that. And um, if you follow me on Facebook, I post weekly a video blog, basically of kind of all the stuff that I've, that has been done in that week. I like that for two reasons. One is I like sharing with the community to say this is what's involved in the HMO. But then I also like doing it for my own kind of sanity to work out um, how it's turned, how it's transformed week by week to kind of come to where it is. That's nice. The other thing that's ace is just back to the finance part is knowing that um, what they teach you in courses in some ways works if you kind of do it right. You know, you can pull out enough or you can leave enough cash in to give a good return um you can get it to give you that profit per month i want to say enjoy the kind of um when a when a room goes empty and you have to try and fill it but i've become used to that that's just part of the process that's kind of you know i, I use a letting agent i chase them to say how many viewings have we got this week um do we need to consider dropping the price and so on and, and stuff like that it's just the time I invest in property is nowhere near the time that I'd need to invest in the corporate side to achieve that income level per month. Got it. Matt, we talked about the past. Before we move on to your present and your future plans in HMO property, let's take a minute to thank our sponsors. Are you looking for an effortless HMO mortgage experience? If that's a yes, there's only one place to go. www.thehmomortgagebroker.co.uk the UK's number one specialist HMO mortgage broker. They're so specialized that they don't do anything else. HMO mortgages, HMO remortgages, and HMO bridging. That's it. They have access to every HMO lender out there and even some exclusive products not available to other brokers. With lightning fast service and A1 communication, they're easily the best HMO broker in town. So to experience HMO lending made easy, go to www.thehmomortgagebroker.co.uk today matt fast forwarding to the present day just tell us a bit more about your current portfolio i know you've only got two properties but give us a bit of a flavor of what they're all about yeah cool so um they're both pretty close to each other one is um uh they're both six bedroom hmos um one is kind of i'd say in a more uh, fla favorable location the other one not as much um the first one is a bit more roomy because there was already kind of six bedrooms i just kind of turned the lounge into a bedroom the second one it was a bit more of my creative side coming in to s squeeze six bedrooms in to kind of meet the guidelines of the local council um it works people are happy in there there's double beds in every room um I like them. What, what I wanted to do when I became a HMO landlord, landlord was to really understand or 
uh, empathize, put myself in the customer's shoes. I call them customers as well as tenants, basically. And I'm my houses are what I call products. So I try to make the best sort of product for my customer to be happy with. And to do that, I kind of emphasize, emphasize in what does the tenant actually look for? What do they want? What would I want, basically, live in there? So I try to make sure that, um, for example, I don't do, I haven't done en suites yet. I will be doing them in my next projects. Um, but I provide double beds always in every room. I always provide chest of drawers, wardrobe, desk, and so on. Um, I provide washing machine tumble dryer. I provide two standalone fridge freezers. I provide one base cupboard, one wall cupboard in every uh, for every tenant in the kitchen. Uh, no more than three people per one oven and hob, or no more than three people per bathroom, just to kind of not be overcrowded. Um, I also um, thought about kind of what happens when they're in the rooms type thing and knowing professionals like I would know myself is I love stuff like Netflix or any sort of Amazon Prime or whatever so I provide smart smart TVs in every room um, and I also pay for a monthly Netflix subscription so that all of them have Netflix on demand basically so that was my way of the way I kind of spin it is that we don't just look after you with big storage space and stuff for like that. We like to look after your lifestyle. We know that you come back home a tired one a week and just watch Netflix. So we'll provide that and you don't have to pay the annoying six pounds, seven pounds a month yourself. Nice. Okay, Matt, tell us about one significant mistake that you've made in your HMO business that by sharing, you might help others avoid. Mm -hmm. So on my first house, um, again, in, experience is invaluable and I always make a lesson on my Facebook stuff to share all the failures that I've gone through. One of the probably biggest ones I'd say is um, picking the right builders, which can be really, really hard if you've got no existing project because builders have a sixth sense, in my opinion, spot a newbie. Um, and that naturally means that if you don't know technically what you're doing half the time, I wouldn't even say that I know technically now, but I've got enough experience and, and I picked the right person to trust. They can kind of elevate the prices um, of their stuff. What I would recommend to people um, is always make a schedule of works yourself. Because um, basically the learning point in summary is that I paid too much for my first builder, uh, my first HMO. And I think that it's probably because I picked the wrong builders uh, who kind of added a thousand pounds to here, there and everywhere. Um, so I, the way to, I suggest to avoid that is to um, work out where you are now, your existing floor plan and where you want to be, your proposed floor plan. Make a schedule of works, an Excel list of items to say how to get from existing to proposed. Be specific with your estimates on uh, the amount of linear meters of stud work you needed to be created. Um, be specific on the amount of meters squared of plaster, uh, plastered walls. Stick that onto your spreadsheet. Invite two or three people at Builders Round. The other important thing is try to go from word of mouth through people on this podcast community or people local to your HMO community, because HMOs is a bit of a niche um, area where you probably do a bit more than what you would on a flip. Get builder recommendations from the people local to you. Invite them in, about two or three. Give them the same schedule of works that has specific measurements and get them to quote on an itemized bill. And that's the best way to work out, one, if you like them, and two, the important thing about the specific measurements, like 40 metres squared of plaster, um, is that they'll all quote for 40 metres squared of plaster. If you just put plaster the whole house, some people would assume a quote for 120 meters squared of plaster. Some might quote for 10 meters squared. It's a way of maybe pulling the wool over your eyes, putting the 10 meters squared in to get it look cheap. And then when they actually come to bill you, you're already, already committed to that builder, mm. which is probably where I am. I had a decent quote to start off with and then little bits kind of come up and up and up that made it kind of harder. What do you, what do you think that mistake cost you in the short term? Uh, financially, I'd say I probably paid about 25 grand more on my first refurb. So I, re I, budget I think it cost me, the builder side cost me about £75,000. Um, I reckon I should have done it for 50 grand or less. I mean, to put it into context, the first house was, it was already kind of HMO rooms. It was just a case of tarting it up 
um, so to speak, and making it structurally sound. There were some structural issues, but it should not have cost 78 grand. On my second HMO, which was um, a lot more walls removed, a lot more um, stud work created, and it, it even included a loft conversion. All, all in all, that cost me 55 grand. So to even do a loft conversion and the six and to do the six bedroom HMO was 55 grand versus the 78 grand to do a house that was didn't need as much work as the second house did. You're not the first and you won't be the last. No, I want to say I was lucky in terms of doing my numbers to work out that even paying that much, I'm still getting 39% return on my money. So it, I was lucky in terms of, yeah, I got stung, but the numbers were so big in terms of the HMO profit that it was easy to kind of, well, it was less risk to kind of make the mistake and be burned from it, so to speak. Matt, tell us about your HMO portfolio plans for the next 12 months. Yeah, cool. So I've got, um, so I'm currently investing with a JV partner. Uh, we met each other about eight months ago. And at the moment, it's a relationship where essentially he provides the money and I provide the time, experience, contacts, skills, trades, whatever. I kind of do everything from finding it to getting it done to maintaining the tenancy and I share in the profits. Um, he's happy, I'm happy. So currently we've got three properties that we've um, partnered up with so far. The first, um, we um, are currently doing a refurbishment. The plan is, is currently a three bed house and we've taken it to a six bedroom HMO. Sounds extreme, but there's a big floor space on that property. Um, the fourth house is currently going through um, HMO planning application, which sounds scary, but so long as you have been through it already and know what you're doing, it's just a case of it's a risk, don't get me wrong, but it's sometimes a valuable thing because what we're finding in our own area is that HMO, all existing HMOs are come with a really hefty price tag that doesn't make the deal stack up. So we've been looking for houses that we can convert to HMOs and we have the, let's say, have a skill set now that knows whether it's likely to get approval or not. So anyway, the, the fourth house has gone through planning we hope that it should be um approved within the next three to four months and then the plan on that house is four stories it's going to be a seven bedroom hmo and then um the fifth house is a recent one um we haven't completed yet and i never really i, I try not to announce the ones until it's kind of signed sealed and delivered but that one is an existing hmo um it's currently licensed got planning and license as a six bedroom hmo it's completely run down, um, which makes it a great opportunity for someone to buy. Um, and the plan on that one is to um, kind of restart with the refurb, um, apply for a, an extra one, maybe two bedrooms. I haven't looked at the floor plan yet, and then turn it into a seven or eight bedroom HMO. Uh, what the tenant types I aim at are professionals. Back to the en suites, the third house is going to have three en suite rooms, and I don't see that I don't always look to put on suites in, but where there's some opportunity, it makes sense. I, I don't kind of go, because that's another thing, the courses can sometimes manipulate you into in terms of always look for the en suite HMOs, or just try to throw an en suite room in every bedroom, and sometimes it doesn't work. Absolutely. Everyone, uh, everyone sings the praises of that, but it's not a total cookie cut, cutter event. So you've got three you got two more projects in the pipeline and your 12 month plan, are you looking to get an additional three, four on top of that? Or are you kind of happy we haven't made a plan? What What's your actual 12 month target? I haven't made a plan. I mean, I don't do stuff in 12 months. What I, what I, I've read a really good book. Again, I recommend it. it's called the 12 week year by, uh, I can't remember, Brian Moran or Peter Moran. Great book. Great book. But I do it. I, I love that philosophy and, in a nutshell, basically, instead of 12 months, it's 12 weeks. So you've got 12 weeks. And the reason why that's, they, they teach you it's important is because 12 weeks is long enough to do something, but it's short, it's short enough to kind of have, in simplistic terms, you get four, almost just more than four 12-week years in one actual year. 12 months is too long. So you kind of think, oh, I've got plenty of months to kind of do nothing. And then all of a sudden, it's too late and you give up. So I do that. And um, at the last the last two 12 weeks have all been about just finding one property every month uh, every three every every 12 weeks sorry 
and I managed to achieve that on both of my last quarters. Um, this one, I haven't said anything concrete in the, in the next 12 months, and my reason for that is twofold. One is I've currently got, well, for personal reasons, I've got another kid who, I've got a second child who's come in, so I'm keen to, my whole philosophy about getting started in property was to spend more time with my family and to travel more. They'd be my two goals. Just been acknowledging in terms of not just think about growth for the sake of growth, it's back to kind of achieving the life, the income to get the lifestyle I want from property. So with my five HMO projects that I'll eventually have kind of up and running over the next uh, nine months, my plan is to almost, I'm happy with that. I've also got the house that we're moving into that's going to be another two month refer project as well as the new kid coming. So I've got a lot on my plate, let's say at the moment. That doesn't mean that I'm stopping. I've got a virtual assistant who's basically checking every email alert about new deals, and I check them every week. I mean, the way I see it is that I've got, I've created systems for the way I find deals and analyze them now. Um, this part greed, I don't know why I'd kind of keep going, but basically I've got letting agents who look after the properties for me. So I've tried to leverage myself out of the business, business as much as possible. Um, so that's what I'm doing. I'm just looking if a deal comes up and it's worth my while. Um, the way I see it is that it does is a no brainer to kind of just just go with it and just keep keep accumulating. Matt, apart from building the portfolio, is there anything else that you're up to in property that you'd like to share with HMO Nation? Um, well, just just the, the per, I'm going anything sort of that I'd offer at the moment in terms of let's say coaching or mentorship or something the way i'd see is that yes i've got experience but i've kind of using my own experience to play around my own kind of portfolio personal wise i've bought i managed to kind of through property and who i know i've managed to basically buy my next um future house which is nice so i'm able to apply that and we're basically throwing our experience and money and money that we've accumulated into developing that um the other thing at the moment on the person, because we've got the baby on the go, we're um, it's just to spend more time with them, basically. Okay. Matt, a few more questions. What advice would you give to any current HMO investors? That's people who are already active and in the market like yourself. Cool. Good question. Um, so these are the, yeah, yeah, they've got over, the, first of all, congratulations for getting over the init, initial hump of because it can always be scary that the unknown of trying to work out if what you're doing will actually get to where the result my advice is probably treat your hmos as a business um don't try to buy them and then forget about them uh just like anything your property your prod is your product and your product needs upkeep so always make sure that you're trying to make sure that maintenance is up to date the other thing i'd make sure is like a business objective is understand your properties from a financial perspective so work out quite simply how much uh interest rate or how much return on investment you're getting from the money left in that property because so i think sometimes um you can get a bit emotional in terms of oh i bought that property i've done it up i'm keeping it that's what i'm being told to do but sometimes it might actually make bad sense in a financial perspective that to actually keep it for example, someone might be aiming for a 15% return on investment, but they don't actually realize that the amount of money that they've got left in um, isn't giving them that interest or the unknown maintenance damp issues or whatever have basically meant that you're only earning 9%, which is, you, know, you can easily make probably eight to 10% just investing in stock markets and bonds, for example. So it's, there's easier, less risky, less time intensive ways of getting that type of interest. So. Just evaluate your portfolio, basically, if you've got any, just to see if they are actually delivering the returns that you actually end out to get. And how about any advice you'd give to people who are looking to get into HMO property investing for the very first time? Um, know your area is probably what I would say. Um, when I started looking at Newport, South Wales, there's a few things that I started looking at, first of all, just because of the way I think. One was, um, is there demand for HMOs in whatever area you're looking at? The other thing I'd say is try not to invest too far out of your local area. I think a golden rule I had from one of the um, books I read was try to invest within 15 miles of yourself or try to keep your properties within 15 miles of each other. 
that way you can try you can have the likelihood of using the same letting agent the same trade so it's less people to manage um and then the other thing i'd say is speak to you once you work out that there's a, a demand for wherever you're looking understand the price points to see okay am i likely to get a price that will make the numbers work for example newport's quite good in terms of being cheap houses but pretty good rent so make sure that the cost to acquire that house is proportional to the rent that you can actually achieve per room um two very important things work out that there's demand in your location and then get specific once you work out that there's enough opportunity there go and talk to your local council go and get the hmo guidelines check if it's an article 4 area just get really specific on the systems to make sure that you're Yes, you found an area with good location, good trade, good demand, cheap houses, but make sure that you can actually buy a buy a house there and do it up as a HMO or likely to buy a HMO that you know can work or meets all the guidelines. Yeah, just getting specific about once you work out there's an opportunity, just get and see if you can actually do it. Get specific and get educated, I guess. Matt, finally, before we sign off, we'd like you to recommend one great HMO resource or book, then let HMO Nation know how they can connect with you and then we'll say goodbye. Cool. So oh, you've said HMO specific book. So I, I'm going to think we'll give you a business book as well. Well, I keep going back. I mean, property is such a mindset thing more than there is actually property itself. The book I'd always recommend if you're coming from the employee or corporate side is The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. That's an awesome book for trying to basically imply the importance of leverage, doing more in less time, working smarter, not harder, for a better phrase. The um, book that I'd say, there's a, there's a load of books that I'd recommend in terms of just HMO property specific, you know, House Arrest by... Um, Forgive me, I can't remember the author. If you Google house arrest, it'll be it'll come up. Rick Gannon, sorry. It's That's Rick. One. Yeah. Good one. Property magic is quite good as the overall generic concept. Um, and the progressive property guys and Rob Moore in particular has a few books. If you my kind of one tip I'd say is get an audible account. Um, it's only eight pound a month or something, you get one book free and I use that for when I'm walking, running, driving. We all have out many hours a week that we can have what's called dead time and audio books and podcasts are great for that. But yeah, that's um, that's my one thing. In terms of getting in touch with me, um, I am, my best way of getting in touch with me is via Facebook. So if you search for Matthew Layton, I'm imagining that I'm a mutual friend with someone in this HMO community. Um, and on the, I post weekly about um, kind of the real life of HMOs, basically. I, I try to be as open and honest about maybe finance as well as my mistakes to make sure that people don't make the same mistakes as me. I post weekly updates of whatever refurbs I'm going on at the moment. I say about my kind of post refinance. And I also post about kind of just being aware about making your money. Hashtag make your money work hard. Brilliant. Love it. What we'll do, Matt, is we'll make sure we link up all your contact details in the show notes page. We'll give you some outbound links to your Facebook profile and all that stuff. So if anyone listening to this pod podcast wants to get in touch with you, they absolutely can. Matt, thank you very much for sharing your journey. We salute you. Let's get an HMO high five. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for joining us. If you've enjoyed this and want more informational, educational and inspirational HMO property content, then please hit the subscribe button and give us a like. See you next time.